Hello, and thank you for joining me. My name is Dominic Vella, and I'm a professor of applied maths in the University of Oxford, and I'm also a tutorial fellow at Lincoln College. In this video, I'm going to give you a sense of what applied mathematics is and try and give you a sense also of what it's like to study applied maths at university. I'm going to start by answer, trying to answer the question of what it is that applied mathematicians do. And in a nutshell, what we do is to develop and then solve mathematical models motivated by real world problems. But what that looks like can vary enormously between different subfields of applied maths. So, for example, historically, there's been a lot of uh, work in applied maths motivated by the flow of fluids and to get a sense of that you might pour yourself a glass of orange juice in the morning and what you'll notice is that there are bubbles forming but those bubbles don't stay where they first reach the surface of the water they tend to clump together over the course of a few seconds and minutes and then to move to the edge of the glass. As an applied mathematician I'm interested in how fast that happens and why it happens. There are of course lots of applications of applied maths to problems associated with data and images and as an example of that there's a lot of work going on in how you restore images for example if you take a photograph and then print it then that photo will become creased over many years and you might be interested in having an algorithm that allows you to first digitize that image again and then smooth out the creases and there are indeed what's called image inpainting algorithms that allow you to do just that. Increasingly, there's interest in how to analyze and understand data. And that involves taking data, for example, this map of some of the election results from the US in, uh, presidential election in 2016, and trying to understand data at different electoral districts that in a way that preserves the geographical uh, information that's present in the map, but also allows you to see deeper connections and deeper structure within that data. So how do applied mathematicians address these problems? Well, of course, they're dealing with very different problems, but the sort of unifying idea is that there's some fundamental principle underlying the problem that they're interested in, and we try to express that uh, underlying principle mathematically and then to see what the consequences of the various mathematical techniques that we know are. So I try and give you a concrete example of what that looks like by using a principle that you've probably seen at school, Newton's second law, which says that the forces on a body, F, is equal to the mass times its acceleration. Okay. Now, you may also know from your work at school that the acceleration of a body is the second derivative of its position with respect to time. And so Newton's second law, once written down, allows you in principle to solve for the position x of a body if you know the forces on it and the mass. So again, as a more concrete example, you might be familiar with the example of a simple pendulum. That's a mass m on the end of a string of length l. Okay, And the forces on the body are its weight mg and the tension of the string. But you can write down Newton's second law by thinking about the motion tangential to, uh, sorry, the force is tangential to the motion. So the force in the tangential direction is minus mg times sine of theta, where theta is the angle that the string makes to the vertical. And that's got to be equal to the mass from Newton's second law times the acceleration, which in the tangential direction is the length times the second derivative of theta. So at this point, we've expressed the fundamental principle, Newton's second law, in terms of mathematics. And now we'd like to try and see what the consequences of that fundamental physical principle are. And we're using the techniques of mathematics that you've seen at A-level. So the first thing that you'd like to do is to divide both sides by m. But another simplification you can make is to say that for very small angles, theta much less than 1, then sine theta is approximately equal to theta. <clears throat> and that means that our sine theta on the left-hand side here from forces is approximately just a theta. And then if I introduce omega to be the square root of g over l, g being the gravitational acceleration, then I get a much simpler looking equation. In fact, you may recognize it as being the equation for simple harmonic motion. Okay. Now, if you've seen simple harmonic motion, then you might know that the solution of this equation, this differential equation, is that theta is some amplitude a times cos of omega t plus some phase phi. 
If you haven't seen it, don't worry. What's important is that there's time here multiplied by some constant. So as time increases, the argument of my cos increases also. And as you know that cos is an oscillatory function, you expect theta to oscillate backwards and forwards, just as you expect a pendulum would. Now the main result of this analysis is the frequency of the pendulum omega is the square root of g over l. And I think the first time that you see this result, you might be surprised that it's both independent of the mass that's stuck on the end of the pendulum, and it's also independent of the amplitude that you pull the pendulum back to, provided, of course, that you stick to this small angle theta assumption. So just to test this idea that the, um, that the frequency is independent of the mass of the pendulum, I took my two daughters to the park and put them on adjacent swings. One is about half the mass of the other. And so when released at the same time, what you see is that they do indeed oscillate with the same frequency. So if we want to vary the frequency, it's very difficult to vary g. It's very easy to vary the length l. OK, so just to give you a demonstration of that, I'm going to show you a video from the Harvard Natural Sciences demos in which they take a whole series of pendula of different lengths and then release them at the same time. And what you'll see is that, as we expect, though they have very different frequencies of oscillation. And as you also, as we expect, those with the shortest length L oscillate most quickly at the highest frequency, while those with the longer length uh, have a much lower frequency of oscillation. Now, if you go on to YouTube and watch the rest of this video, you'll see that actually the lengths here have been chosen very carefully so that there's a very nice periodicity of the motion. But the reason I've shown it to you here is because I want to introduce this idea that while the single pendulum might only have time vary, uh, vary with time, other problems might also involve variations in space. And that's what applied math mathematics at university often involves. It involves studying functions that vary both with space and time, or maybe functions that vary in two different spatial directions. So very crudely, if you want to have an idea of what applied maths at university means, it's about how do we make models that vary in space and time or in more than one spatial dimension, but also how do we solve those models analytically and numerically? Well, one of the things, first things that we need to do to, to understand that is to have some notation. So if we, well, we've got the, the idea of a derivative from school is written with a straight d by dt. When you're thinking about multiple variables, you need to be a bit more careful about notation. And so we distinguish it from this straight d by dt using a curly d by dt. There are two courses in the first year of the un Oxford undergraduate that sort of deal with this sort of notation and so on. In the first one, we sort of think a little bit about what the difference between this curly d by dt and straight d by dt is. And in the second course, we think a little bit about how we do things like integration in more than one variable. Now, it turns out that once you've got that nomenclature under your belt, then there are three equations that come up time and again. The first is what's called the wave equation, and we'll see a little bit about why that is in a second, but it involves two time derivatives and two space derivatives. The second equation is what's called the diffusion, or sometimes the heat equation. That involves only one time derivative and two space derivatives. And the third equation, called Laplace's equation, looks an awful lot like the wave equation because it has two derivatives in two different variables. But crucially, rather than being on opposite sides of the equality, they're on the same side of the equality. And that actually gives you some fundamentally different behaviours. Now, again, in the third year, there's a course that talks about how we solve each of these three different equations analytically. But obviously we can't talk about that today. So what I'm going to try and do instead is give you a sense of how the solutions of these different equations behave. OK, so sort of a qualitative idea of each of these different equations. So I'm going to start off by talking about the wave equation. And the wave equation, as you might expect, given that it has two time derivatives, often follows from Newton's second law. The two time derivatives here are reminiscent of the acceleration that we talked about in the pendulum example. And it turns out that the force can also often be written as a second derivative with respect to x. Now, that's just the equation, the constant. There's a, there's a constant c here. Uh, 
and if even if you if you're not familiar with multiple derivatives you might be might be happy to see that there's a a general solution that is actually surprisingly simple it says that the solution of the wave equation f of x and t can be written as some function of x minus c times t plus another function of g of x plus c t now again even if you haven't seen calculus yet you might have seen how to think about graphs being translated to the left and right so you can imagine that as time increases this c times t gets larger and I'm translating this graph to the right by an amount ct. So this f of x minus ct corresponds to a wave moving to the right at some constant speed c. Conversely, this g of x plus ct corresponds to a wave moving to the left at a speed c as well. OK, so that's what the general solution of the wave equation looks like. It involves waves traveling in two different directions and that's also what you might expect if you think about what happens when you listen to music. Your stereo or your speaker might be in your bedroom and separated from your parents or neighbors by a wall and so sound travels from your speaker to the wall and you'd like all of it to be reflected so that you can listen to it but invariably some of it is transmitted. Now after the third year course on waves and compressible flow you'll actually be able to do a calculation that talks about what the relative ratio of what's transmitted to what is reflected is. And it turns out that that ratio is inversely proportional to the frequency omega of the sound that you're listening to. Now that's important because it means that bass notes, low frequencies, tend to be preferentially transmitted rather than reflected, while the melody, the high frequencies, tend to bounce off the wall. And that's why it is that when you're at a traffic light and a car pulls up, you hear a really thumping bass, even if there is a very uh, loud melody as well. It simply doesn't get transmitted through the wall. Now, it turns out that there are other solutions of the wave equations, uh, wave equation as well. So one that's very common is what's called um, a normal mode. That, and you can think about that as being what happens when you hit a drum. Okay, so when you hit a drum, you set the skin of the drum vibrating at a particular frequency, and the skin of the drum then has to satisfy a particular shape. Now, it turns out that there are different modes with different shapes that the drum, could, drum skin can adopt, and each of those different modes has a different frequency as well. Okay. Now, if you or when you're able to come to the Andrew Wiles building, uh, then you'll see that actually outside some of the lecture rooms, there's this big glass roof, uh, and the the, the sh surface of that glass roof is designed to look like the eigen mode of the wave equation for that particular boundary. Now, the key thing is that each of these different shapes has its own frequency, but it's also important that that frequency depends on the shape of the boundary around the sort of the edge of your drum, if you like. Okay, and that means that the sound will depend on what the shape of the drum is, but it'll also depend a little bit on how you hit the drum. And just to demonstrate that for you, I'm going to show you a quick demonstration with a mug. Okay, and I'm going to take a mug and I'm just going to tap it with a teaspoon. Now, a mug is essentially a, a perfect cylinder, except for the handle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap the mug at roughly 45 degrees relative to the handle, and then I'm going to tap it at 90 degrees. And I want you to listen out for what the difference between these, those two sounds is. So first, 45 degrees. OK, and now 90 degrees. OK, maybe you can't hear the difference, but if I do them in quick succession, you will be able to. OK, so that's really because there are different modes of the mug that are available for it to oscillate at. One in which there's an antinode on the handle and one on which the antinode is at 45 degrees to the handle. And which of those two modes I excite depends on where I hit the mug as well. So that gives us the idea that we should really try listening to the sound and quantifying a little bit more about the sound that we're making. And to do that, I sort of took a plate at home and I use my iPad to generate a spectrum. Now, what this means is you have sort of the intensity of the sound on the y-axis with the frequency of the sound on the x-axis. 
And what you see is that there are a whole series of peaks in this spectrum which correspond to particular frequencies that the plate vibrates at. They're a well-defined frequency and those correspond to different normal modes of the, of the plate. But if I take a different shaped plate, here's a star that my daughter made a few years ago, um, and then I think about what happens when I hit that, then you see that actually there are different peaks relative to the first one. So again, because of the shape of the boundary of the plate, these peaks are in different places. And so the sound of these two plates is distinctly different. That then begs the question, well, suppose I just listen very carefully to the, to the sound that is made by a drum and I analyse that sound and look at which frequencies are in it, then maybe I can tell what shape drum is being hit. And that was sort of formulated in a very famous uh, question by Kak in 1966, who asked the question, well, can you hear the shape of a drum? And it took almost 30 years to answer that question. It turns out that the answer is no, you can't hear the shape of the drum. And here's a counterexample. These are two slightly artificial looking drums that have exactly the same spectrum when, when um, analysed. OK. So I've talked about the wave equation motivated mostly by sound, but there are many other examples of the wave equation. One that you might be familiar with is what's called the phantom traffic jam. And this is what happens when you're sort of traveling on the motorway or on an A road and you're going at a steady speed and all of a sudden the car in front of you slows down and it looks like you've run into a traffic jam caused by an accident or someone breaking down. But just as suddenly as that traffic jam started, it suddenly evaporates and you're free to go on your way with no sign of an accident. And what's happening there is that uh, people don't drive at a steady velocity and small perturbations to the speed at which the person in front of you is, uh, is driving can then lead to a big perturbation to how fast you're going. And the One Show did a really nice demonstration of this a few years ago where they asked people to drive at a steady 10 miles an hour round a big circle. And what you see is that someone slows down a little bit here and that causes everyone behind them to slow down and it ends up in a traffic jam that propagates backwards around the circle. Now, as I said, there are many other examples of the wave equation, for example, in gravitational waves generated by the um, collision and merger of black holes or the primary and secondary waves generated by earthquakes. And while the details of each of those different examples are important and different, the sort of key elements are the same. So there's a lot to be gained by studying the solution of the, the simplest problem, the wave equation that I've talked about here. Now the second equation that I mentioned was the diffusion equation and that's interesting because it has a different kind of fundamental principle underlying its derivation. So I'd like to just quickly run through that derivation to illustrate that different physical principle. It turns out that the diffusion equation is often called the heat equation because it describes the flow of heat, for example, in a metal bar. So if I think about what happens to the temperature of a little section of a metal bar in a small interval of time, that temperature can only change if a different amount of heat flows in one end and to the amount of heat that flows out of the other end. And I can write that down mathematically by saying that the heat energy in this section delta x is proportional to the volume A times delta x, where A is the cross-sectional area. And it's also proportional to the, the change in energy is proportional to the change in temperature over the small interval of time delta t. I've introduced here a density and a specific heat capacity, but those are just physical constants. Now, as I said, that energy can change only if a different amount flows in from one end then out from the other. And so I have to equate that change in temperature to a difference in what's called the flux, the flow of heat between the two sides of the cylinder. So I want an equation just for the temperature T. So there I need to appeal to what's called Fourier's law, which tells us that the flux Q is equal to minus the gradient dt by dx, okay, with a constant of proportionality that's called the conductivity. Now the important thing is that it has a minus sign here, so that expresses the idea that heat flows from where it's hot to where it's cold, and it's also proportional to the gradient dt by dx rather than some other derivative. Now, if I substitute this expression into the right hand side of my equation and then do the sort of limiting process that you might be familiar with from first principles calculus, then what I find is exactly the diffusion equation 
dt by dt is big D times the second derivative of t with respect to x. So again, we can't talk about um, how to solve that exactly, but I'd like to give you an idea of the behaviour of the solution of the diffusion equations that's motivated by my favourite recipe for cooking brownies. Now this recipe is sort of starts off as you might expect. It tells you how much butter and sugar and so on you might need. But I find the first instruction is a little bit surprising. It tells you that you should first lightly grease a shallow square cake tin and it tells you how big that cake tin should be. So the question is, well, why does it tell us what size tin to use? Why is that important in a recipe? And what should we do if we only have a smaller cake tin? Now, of course, we could scale down the volume of mix that we make, but I'd like to have the same amount of brownie. So how should I change the cooking time? So we need a model for what happens when you cook a brownie. And I've chosen the example of a brownie because a brownie is very thin. And so as a sort of simple approximation, you might think of it as being a slab of cake. OK, so I'm only going to think about what happens in the vertical direction, the y direction. And I'm going to assume that what's happening when I cook a brownie is I put it into the oven so that the top and bottom are hot. And what I need to do to cook the brownie is get the middle to that higher temperature. So I need, it's an example like the bar I talked about on the last slide, where I need heat to diffuse into the centre of the brownie. Now, as I said, the, heat equa the diffusion equation is often called the heat equation. And so I think about what the temperature of the brownie is as a function of time. I've already said that I can't solve this just yet. But what I can say is that divide, differentiating with respect to time is a little bit like dividing by time. So if I think about the time taken to cook, I'd have a 1 over t cook on the bottom line. And differentiating with respect to y is a little bit like dividing by the thickness h. So what I'd expect then if I rearrange this equation is that the time taken to cook my brownie scales or is proportional to the thickness squared. And that's really important. The cooking time is proportional to the square of the thickness of the thing I'm cooking. Now that's important in this brownie example because the recipe fixes my volume of brownie mix, but I'm changing the area of the tin that I'm making. So I'm making it a smaller area and hence a thicker mix. But what I think is surprising is that because of this quadratic dependence on the thickness, actually a relatively small change in the size of my tin means that the cook, you need to cook the brownie for three times longer to get the centre to the right temperature. Now, obviously, that's a very simple example, um, and applied mathematicians are interested in a sort of variants of that. And one that's very common and very popular in particularly mathematical biology is to think about how two chemicals uh, diffuse and interact together. So I might have a chemical C1 that has its own diffusion equation, but with an extra term that involves its interaction with the second chemical C2, which also diffuses but has its own interaction with C1. And what's interesting about this is that actually, depending on exactly what shape domain you solve the equation on, you can get some interesting patterns. So this is a video taken from the shape of math where they solve this problem on a rectangular domain and on a square domain. And what you'll see is that on the rectangular domain, you tend to get stripes, while on the square domain, you tend to get spots. And that's something that's really interesting for mathematical biologists because they've noticed that um, a lot of animals, particularly big cats, tend to have spots on their coats, but then stripes on their tails. And so the question is, well, can this be explained by the behaviour of the diffusion equation on different uh, domains or different domains of different aspect ratio? The tail is more like the rectangle and the body is more like the square. These are the sorts of questions that are covered in various courses on pattern formation in the third and fourth years of the Oxford undergraduate. Now, the third equation that I wanted to talk about is Laplace's equation, and that comes about in a whole series of different problems. You'll see it first, I think, in the second year option on fluid dynamics, where it's used to describe the flow of air around an aircraft wing. But you'll also see it in the third year option on electromagnetism, where you think about the electric field between two charges. And um, you might also see it in problems involving evaporation of liquid, which again involves the diffusion of water vapour. And the characteristic of the solution of Laplace's equation that I want to tell you a little bit about today is that 
Laplace's equation really does not like corners. And you may have seen that if you've studied physics because you will have been told that a curved conductor will lead to an accumulation of charge and hence a much larger electric field. Okay, And that's the reason that very tall pointy buildings tend to get struck by lightning more often. But it's also the, a, a sort of fundamental um, principle that gives rise to a variety of other everyday phenomena as well. So for example when you spill a drop of coffee and watch it evaporate, you'll find that rather than getting a homogeneous stain of coffee, you tend to get a much darker ring around the outside of the coffee drop than in the centre. And that's really a consequence of the fact that evaporation happens much more quickly at the edge of the droplet, sort of in an analogy to this high electric field. A very similar thing is again um, shown by cooking. So when you cook potato wedges you or chips, you may have noticed that the corners, the sharp corners, tend to get much more brown and crispy and burnt even than the faces. And again, that's because evaporation of the water happens preferentially along these very sharp corners and hence they get to a higher temperature and can burn more easily. So I've talked to you about sort of a, a sort of informal sense of how these solutions look and a lot of that's informed by analytical work. But it's not always possible to solve these problems analytically and so it's really important to be able to use computers in an intelligent way. And that's what is known sort of more formally as the subject of numerical analysis, which again is studied uh, in the undergraduate degree at Oxford. So for example in the second year course, the first course you'd study on numerical analysis, you might ask the question, well a lot of the problems I've talked about involve a continuous function that varies continuously in space or time, but I've got a finite computer so I need to be able to discretize that continuous function um, at particular points. And that raises questions about how you do that in a sensible way, but then also how do you deal with matrices and so on in an efficient way on a computer. In the third year courses on numerical analysis you then move on to think a little bit more about um, how the particular equations that I've talked about today behave and how to find their solution numerically, starting off with the diffusion equation and then moving on to Laplace's equation. I've given you a sense of the different problems that applied mathematicians are interested in, but now I want to finish by talking to you a little bit about why I think it's worth studying applied maths. Now for me personally it's really important to get the perspective on the world around you that I hope I've given you a sense of today, whether that's from cooking brownies and potato wedges to things involving the flow of fluids um, and many other examples besides. But it's also important because it allows you to use your mathematical training to help those doing science, other sciences and industrial processes, thinking particularly about how you can optimise industrial processes. That's why you should study it at university, but it's also important to think about what happens in the future. And I think that you might be um, interested in thinking a little bit about what sort of careers people who study applied maths go on to. And in recent years, we've had graduates go on to a whole range of careers in finance, software engineering, code breaking and teaching. And of course, a large number have also stayed on to do research in applied maths as well. So that's all I wanted to tell you about today. If you'd like to find out more about, about applied mathematics, and I really recommend this short book called Applied Mathematics, A Very Short Introduction. Uh, it's written by a colleague, Alain Gorielli, but it really gives you a, a sense of all of the different areas in which applied mathematics can play. So that's it from me today. Thank you for sticking to the end of the video, and I very much hope to see you in Oxford sometime soon. Goodbye.